Hey guys, welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. In each episode, we're going to have conversations with some of the top investors, superstar founders, as well as well-known tech company executives in Silicon Valley. We'll have a coffee chat with them to learn their way of thinking and actionable tips on how they build or invest in a successful company. Before we start our show today, I want to make sure the listener, aka you, understand that everything a person say on the podcast only reflects hers or his own opinion, not the show or the company they work at. Today, our guest is a partner at Initialized Capital. Prior to venture capital, she worked as the VP of People and Culture at Reddit. She is passionate about building scalable, inclusive institutional cultures. Before joining Reddit, she worked at Pixar as the script supervisor and Cloud as the head of people and culture. Her name is Caitlin Holloway. This episode is the first part of the conversation with Caitlin, in which we'll focus on how Caitlin started her career in tech and the fundamentals of how to build strong relationships for both life and work. Welcome to the show, Caitlin. Thank you so much for having me, Grace. I'm happy to be here. Caitlin, I have to say you have a quite interesting path to tech. You started your career in teaching, to working at Pixar, then to Reddit, and eventually transition into investing at Initialized Capital. I want to hear from your perspective on how you started in tech and the story and thoughts behind all the career moves. Yeah,、um, it's it's been a long and winding road, I would say.、Uh, I wish that I could tell you that I was very strategic and mapped the whole thing out,、uh, but I did not. <laughs>、um, I you. Yeah, I, I think that what my、um, the common denominator, the thing that really kind of helped lead me from from place to place, really has been ultimately curiosity.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, you know, I was raised in a home with with public educators. My mom's a teacher, her husband's a teacher, and so I was. I think that I was raised to be very naturally curious about things, and、um, and more than just be curious and ask questions, but really kind of pull that thread when something is of interest. And、mm-hmm. um, I'm very grateful to my parents for not raising me、uh, to just have one particular path or one thing、mm-hmm. in mind.、Uh, I never felt the pressure. Like you must be a doctor, you must be a lawyer,、mm-hmm. um, and so I feel like I've just have been kind of tripping through my career, stumbling along,、uh, finding interest in, in random variable things.、Um, but I really, when I when I like something, I love it,、mm-hmm. and、uh, and then as I say often, you know, I, I feel like I get to a place in a particular job at a particular company where my cup is full,、mm-hmm. my heart. I, I have the experience of I must have learned what I came here to learn,、um, and then I become curious about something else,、mm-hmm. uh, and I pull that thread or I, I follow that path. And、uh, thankfully, that has netted out the positive for me.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> a few times, I made a few missteps, but I, I think that you know, knowing that the path is open ended and, and long, and the journey ahead of me is great,、uh, I really have been able to kind of transition from one job to the next pretty、mm-hmm. gracefully, even if they haven't seemed like it made a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, for example, going from Pixar into into tech.、Um, You know, on the on the surface, it seems very non sequitur. You know, going. I think this the job that I had at Pixar when I left. I was working、um, uh, with a story team、uh, in production, and then moving over to a little tiny, you know, twenty one person company in tech. As、uh, I, gosh, I can't even remember what my first title there was. I think it was like director of creative solutions, or something like. I totally made. <laughs> Um, but I, I essentially was doing operations、mm-hmm. for、um, a young tech company, and、mm-hmm. everyone kind of looked at me and they were like, "What do you? What? How did that happen?" <laughs>、uh, but the story behind the story is that I had a、um, when I was at Pixar, I got very interested in writing children's books, and I was introduced to.、Um, a, I found a woman、uh, actually on Twitter. She was my first internet friend <laughs>、um, that I. <laughs> Enjoyed her books.、Um, she was a published children's book author, and she was working at Disney. And I said, "Oh my gosh, I work at Pixar." We started talking. We became friends. We both. She had just moved to the Bay Area. We met in real life. It was so exciting.、Um, and long story short, she became my mentor on the children's book writing side of things. And eventually,、uh, when I said, "Hey, how do I commit to this? This is something I really want to do."、Um, she was super supportive and was like, "Go for it." And at the same time. I hit writer's block. I hit like the gnarliest 
oh my gosh, I don't know how to create because I'd left my job at the studio and blah, blah, blah. And so anyway, long story short, she eventually then introduced me to her then boyfriend who was the CEO of this company. She said, hey, my, my boyfriend just got his series B. Like if you're creative, if, if what you're missing from your creative flow is people, that, that mm-hmm. was what was determined, um, go and trade him. He could use some help and, and then you can have your creative mojo back and it will all be great. Mm-hmm. So I went to, that's how I transitioned from film to tech. It wasn't this great thought out scheme uh, or plan. I, I just wanted to create and I wanted to be around good people creating beautiful things. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I got into tech and I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. Like, this is it. I found the spot. Uh, so that was a long time ago now, 10 years mm-hmm. ago. So lots of different small companies in between here and there and, and some big ones and everything. What I found really interesting is in each step of your career, you took a leap from the past position. It seems like you're always really confident and very ambitious. Curious, where did the internal drive come from? Were you always the super social person who interact with everyone? Or do you read a lot of motivational books that encourages you to pursue something bigger? What were the actions you took early on in your career to push yourself forward? That's a good question. Uh, I actually haven't reflected back on what some of those early steps were, but I, I think that I would say uh, I, I love people. I really, really do. Uh, but I am actually a very deep introvert. And most people mm-hmm. don't know that about me or they don't mm-hmm. assume, uh, because I do enjoy being on stage. I do enjoy mm-hmm. talking with people very much. Um, but I, it takes a lot of energy from me, mm-hmm. uh, so replenishing me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I have, I have to be very careful how I spend that energy. And I think that that actually helps me mm-hmm. pick, choose how I spend my time and who I spend my time with. Uh, there are some people who, who could talk all day long with people and, and they, you know, they, they're the life of the party and they love going into big groups. They love one-on-ones. They, they love it all. Um, but for me, I had to be much more intentional about it. And so I did, I do, I do a lot of research. I, I really, um, I'm competitive, which is something I don't say out loud very often either. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really, I'm mostly competitive with myself though. Mm-hmm. And so understanding and reading through, you know, for example, a job description when I was younger and saying, I can do most of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, that's something that my parents gave me uh, because a lot of women won't do that. A lot of women will have to satisfy 100% of the requirements before mm-hmm. applying. Um, and so I don't know if I, I have a false sense of like overconfidence or just the ability um, to quickly learn or to prove myself. Uh, mm-hmm. That has always been my approach is if I can just get an interview, if I can just get my foot in the door, I will convince them <laughs> that <laughs> If, if I am blessed with an opportunity to try, mm-hmm. I will blow them out of the water, right? And so I think that coming from a family that didn't have a lot and uh, coming, you know, I grew up in, I was born in Alaska and I grew up in Stockton, mm-hmm. California, two places that are um, not very resource rich, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I really, I, I had very big goals and very big dreams that I think my parents helped instill in me. But I do think that it was that sense of competition with myself where if I, if I get here, then I can get here. And if I get here, I can get there. Mm-hmm. And how I, how I identified what the next step was, I think that that's, when it, that's where it comes to connecting with people. Mm-hmm. And this goes back to what I was saying about being very intentional with how I spend my time and where I spend my time. Mm-hmm. It came down to doing my research on who was doing the job that I was curious about. Mm-hmm. Uh, who has the job that I want, but who has a job that I'm curious about. And so I would say in my career before I had built really my own network, um, Mm -hmm. I really started investigating and reading about people that I admired, uh, people who were in interesting industries. uh, Mm -hmm. And I thought I wanted to go into book publishing. And so Mm -hmm. I found the people in San Francisco that I thought were, you know, had the, had the brightest, shiniest name on the Mm -hmm. board. Um, And I was shocked that people actually wrote back and they actually said hello to me and they took me up on the offer for coffee. Mm -hmm. Um, There are so many tools nowadays like LinkedIn, like Twitter, that you really can connect with, with strangers. And it's not a big, scary thing anymore. Um, 
but it doesn't hurt to ask. And I think that that, I, I really do attribute that before I had built my own personal brand or my own network, um, or could point to a resume, you know, and say, Oh, but I've, I've done that. Uh, when I still was like, I think I can do that. <laughs> it really is making these relationships and connections with people mm-hmm. that I didn't know at all. Um, and so when I say I'm an introvert, it takes a lot of energy for me to do that. But that's mm-hmm. something that has like, I can list, I can list the people back when I was in my like early twenties mm-hmm. who took a shot and said, yes, who, who replied to a cold email or a cold tweet. Um, and I'm so grateful for those people. Even if I chose not to go into that industry there, you know, there, there are lots of interesting people who are willing to help and willing to share. Mm-hmm. I love that you're taking initiative about reaching out. You're always open-minded, exploring and learning about new things, creating a roadmap for yourself to try to move things forward. So after you identify a place that you want to be, what are the actions you took to go after it? Do you take courses to learn how to do a certain job? Or how do you study the industry and acquire the skills to get yourself into the door? Another thing you mentioned is creating connections and build relationships. After the first meeting, say with the Twitter lady, how do you follow up and turn it into an active connection? Yeah, uh, there's a there there's a lot in there. Um, I would say that I so d- let's talk about the like research part, right? Like the study do like from a, a hard skill set um, and a soft skill set, how, how to approach it. And I, uh, again, people fascinate me and something that I didn't know you could even turn into a job until obviously much later in my career. And I'm so grateful for it. Uh, but when I was, when I was younger in my career and I didn't realize that that was actually a path that you could take, um, it just was a natural I just was naturally drawn towards the human behaviors and finding like the pattern match. And so this sounds really silly and almost even creepy. uh, But I actually would study the behaviors of people that were in that organization or within that field, as opposed to the actual field. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I know that, like I said, that sounds really strange, but like, for example, before I got into the world of venture capital, Mm -hmm. I studied the people that I admired in the space. Um, Mm -hmm. I watched their behaviors. I, I looked at their stories. Uh, so for example, there was this book that was written a few years ago called Alpha Girls, mm-hmm. uh, Julianne Guthrie. And mm-hmm. she tells the story of four incredible women who were first on the scene in Silicon Valley on Sand Hill Road and mm-hmm. talked about their backgrounds and, and their journeys. And they were all so different. Their approaches to investing were different. Their, the way they managed uh, you know, adversity in their careers were different. Mm-hmm. The, the way that they uh, celebrated success, uh, the way that they raised their families, um, mm-hmm. the way they navigated their relationships. It, it was also different, but there were definitely some patterns uh, in the in and of behavior for these women. And and one of them was that uh, they all angel invested. They all started angel investing. And mm-hmm. I thought, okay, if this is a path that I'm curious about, mm-hmm. what is a risk way for me to start playing in the space to see if I might be suited for it or if I might enjoy it. And so I was still working as the VP of people and culture at Reddit, but I started making angel investments. Um, And through that process, I met an incredible amount of people who Mm -hmm. were at various stages of their investing careers. Uh, People wanted to share deals and uh, you by articulating what I was interested in, not just like generically angel investing, but specifically, I want to invest in the HR tech space. I want to invest in the family tech space. I want to invest in the you know women's health space. Uh, I By articulating kind of what I wanted, as I was mimicking the women in the book, uh, mimicking the behaviors, mm-hmm. things started to, to manifest for me, uh, whether they were relationships, whether it was deal flow, um, and through those relationships, I started to learn. And I think that if I if I switch to the the question about how do you maintain those relationships or how do you follow up with people, mm-hmm. um, I have a really hard time asking people for things, uh, mm-hmm. personally and professionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm very sparing with my asks. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, also now that I am, you know reaching a more mature point in my own career, in my own life, you know, I have two little kids, I have a demanding job, I have a partner. Um, and so I know that my time is very, very precious. And now thinking back, the the audacious asks that I had of people, 
you know, further along in their career. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were so generous with me mm -hmm. that I always have wanted to put that back into the ecosystem the mm -hmm. same way that it was gifted to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say the, the follow-up question or maintaining relationships, um, I'm also very strategic about that. Uh, I'm not the person who's in your inbox all the time, uh, mm -hmm. reminding you that I exist. Uh, but it, it's thinking about the value that I have and that I can create for that person. So I do reach out. I'm offering something in addition to asking for something. It's not just, hey, I'm going to take, 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 take. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like the, the pick your brain thing is just not, doesn't work yeah. <laughs> anymore. Um, you, you, have to, you have to add value. And I think that being able to articulate for yourself what value you can bring to that particular relationship, it can be a really powerful thing. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, connecting about both being parents or, uh, you know, something happening in a community that you both share mm -hmm. um, or making an introduction. Uh, and this is how your network grows. So just thinking about what you can you can contribute back if they're creating something, how you can support that, how you can amplify what it is, the, the work that they're doing. And so being um, uh, not being in their inbox or in their you know face all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but being very strategic in your asks and being very thoughtful and mindful of, of their, their time and their commitment to you and making it a symbiotic relationship. I really like that you're being really mindful and thinking from the other person's perspective when you're asking for help. Some of our audiences are in the early stage of their career and maybe doesn't have too much to offer yet. Curious, how would you navigate this kind of situation? Is there someone who doesn't seem like have a lot to offer and ask you for something that you said yes? How did they do it? That is a really good question. And it's so interesting. I think that the work that I was so lucky to be a part of it, Reddit has really helped shape my understanding of, of the human mm -hmm. dynamic and human behavior. And I know that that sounds wild, uh, but Reddit, you know, really the communities that, that were, um, that are supported and born on Reddit that thrive on Reddit, mm -hmm. watching those behaviors of the users was really, really, really helpful for me in understanding how humans offline work. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's so funny. I was just talking with my friend, uh, Will Katie, who's the head of brand strategy over at Reddit the other day. And Mm -hmm. We were talking about this notion of, of currency or capital mm -hmm. um, and what each of us have to bring. And in some cases, you know, in, in the world of venture capital, you're literally bringing capital to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and as a founder who's engaging with the venture capitalist, you're bringing a product, right? You're bringing the idea, you're bringing the execution mm -hmm. and you're surrounding the team who can bring that product to life. So you have an idea, now you need capital to make that idea happen. Um, but those things don't matter if you don't have an audience, right? If you don't have a user, if you don't have someone consuming mm -hmm. your idea, um, in addition to needing people that can build that for you. So mm -hmm. there are so many parts of that, that puzzle that need to be in place. And mm -hmm. we all just consider, um, it, I think that we have a hard time distilling or, or separating the capital, uh, the monetary side mm -hmm. of, of value, uh, mm -hmm. from the other parts. And, and the way Will described it to me was you can have, you can be a phenomenal musician. You can be the most skilled guitarist in the world and be up on stage. But if you don't have an audience, does it matter? You need, you need both of those things to make it happen. Um, and then you can, you can add more to that analogy, you know, with the, the crew, the rigs, the lighting, the, you know, the, the, the marketing team, the everything you, you can, you can take that and extrapolate it all the way. Uh, but I think defining for yourself, what you bring to the table, it might just be being an audience member and supporting and clapping for that. And like I said, amplifying their message, retweeting them. I know that sounds so silly, but <laughs> feeling that you support what they're doing and associating yourself as adding value to that, that cause or that mission uh, for that person. And then uh, there are other things, like I said, around, um, you know, maybe it's making an introduction to somebody in your network. We all we all know people. And I think that the, the beauty of the conversation around diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging right now is that there is there is value add in, in every single one of those words. And so bringing a different perspective sometimes is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and another interesting thing that I discovered as I started to talk with people who 
we're further up in the the, the ladder, uh, the, the corporate ladder, uh, mm-hmm. or more successful on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I discovered is that people at some point along the way stopped being honest with them. They stopped giving them feedback. They stopped sharing their real thoughts or feelings because there was a power dynamic. Right. You know, they at work and they're the boss. And so everyone says, yes, of course, that's a great idea. You might have a few people push back within like boundaries, but like for the most part, people just blindly kind of go along because they've reached a certain level of of power in their position, in their role. And the great thing about being someone from the outside is that you can actually give them a very honest reflection of what it is that they're doing. And Mm -hmm. the reality is, is people who are very successful and, uh, have a lot of drive, Mm -hmm. they live for feedback and they live for honest conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's harder and harder to find that the, the further along in your, your career, uh, you, you get. And Mm -hmm. that is, uh, to me, that's just a really funny dynamic that is worth trying to sort out more. But Mm -hmm. what I found when I was talking with people, you know, whether I was at Pixar or, you know, at a, at a small tech company or, you know, at a, at a very large tech company, uh, Mm -hmm just by giving my honest feedback in a lovely, like, of course, in a nice kind way, like you never know that's crap, get it out of here. Mm -hmm. Uh, But again, the the curiosity thing that we started out our conversation with is being curious, like, Oh, why did you make that, that character uh, react in that way? Or why did you make the, that product feature? Uh, Was that something that somebody asked for? Is it because your product person said it? So just being curious about something that maybe you can see that, could use some improvement. And what I found is these people that I was talking with were so grateful. They were like, Oh, I hadn't considered it that way. Or thank you. No, I don't know why no one told me that. Um, so, you know, offering, there is always something of value that you can offer, um, whether it's your own perspective, whether it's simply showing up and supporting and being an audience member, uh, whether it's being a consumer, um, or whether it's, it's extending your network and your relationships, um, or, monetary value, right? There, there's, there's something, there, there are so many different things that, that we can offer, um, support, community, friendship. Um, I mean, the, the list can go on. Uh, and, and trust me when I say I'm not above uh, bribery with baked goods. Uh, mm-hmm. there, there's so much that you can offer. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, next time, brownies on me. <laughs> All right, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Smart Venture Podcast. Don't forget to come back on Wednesday for the second part of the conversation with Caitlin. In the next episode, we'll focus on how to pick the right team to join and the actionable things to do to create a strong network. If you like it, please leave us a quick review and hit subscribe so you don't miss any tips from the experts. If you want to receive our updates, please leave your email at smartventurepod.com. If you want to connect with me, all my socials are at GraceGownGG. Besides LinkedIn, it's just GraceGown. I'd love to connect with you and let me know your thoughts about the show. See you next time.